The city was defended by armed workers' detachments and units of the 50th Army that had pulled back to Tula. Particular steadfastness and courage were demonstrated by the Tula Workers' Regiment, commanded by A.P. Gorshkov and politically Commissar G.A. Agaev. That regiment suffered heavy losses, but did not allow the enemy to enter the city. Nor did the workers of Tula lose their nerve when the enemy virtually closed the ring around the city. Together with the troops of the 50th Army, they continued to fight until the end, showing a high degree of organisation, steadiness and courage. Until November 10, 1941, Tula had been part of the territory of the Bryansk Front. German forces were advancing on it after seizing Orel. Aside from the rear units of the 50th Army, there were no forces in Tula capable of defending the city. In the second half of October, three heavily mauled rifle divisions had retreated to the Tula area. These divisions ranged in strength from 500 to 1,500 men and one artillery regiment was down to four guns. These units were exhausted and required completely new equipment, none of which was available in the rear stores. The workers of Tula, under the leadership of the city's party organisations, worked day and night sewing uniforms and repairing equipment and arms to restore these units to fighting condition. The Defence Committee of Tula, headed by the regional party secretary, Vasily Gavrilovich Zhavoronkov, was also able to assemble and arm a workers' regiment of 600 men within a short time. That regiment, together with units of the 50th Army, manned the approaches to the city in the suburban area of Kosaya Gora. General V.S. Popov, commander of the Tula sector, used an anti-aircraft regiment for anti-tank defence. Tula repulsed an attack by Guderian's tank army on October 30th. Guderian had counted on sweeping through Tula, as he had swept through Oral, and bypassing Moscow on the south. But the units of the Tula sector, including the regiment of local workers, fought the enemy with great courage and valour, setting his tanks afire with bundles of grenades and bottles of gasoline. After the 50th Army was transferred to the Western Front, it was greatly reinforced with manpower and arms available to that front. No matter how hard the enemy tried to take Tula and thus open the road to Moscow from the south, he was unable to do so in the course of November. The city held out like an invulnerable fortress, tying down the entire right flank of the German forces. When the enemy ultimately decided to bypass Tula, Guderian's army was forced to split its forces, losing the operational effectiveness provided by tactical concentration. That is why Tula and its citizens played such an outstanding role in the defence of Moscow. Tula, ancient city of Russian gunmakers, became an unconquerable outpost of the capital, thanks to the solidarity and self-sacrifice of its citizens, who fought with or helped our soldiers in every possible way. I don't think I would be far wrong if I said that the glory given to Moscow as a hero city belongs also to Tula and its people. When we speak here of heroic feats, we obviously have in mind not only our soldiers, commanders and political commissars. What was achieved at the front in October and in subsequent battles was made possible by the combined efforts of Soviet troops and the people of Moscow and the Moscow area, unanimously supported by the entire nation. The wide-ranging activities of the party organisation in the city of Moscow and the Moscow area in rallying the working people in defence of the capital against the enemy took on the character of a heroic epic. The fiery appeals of the party's central committee and the city and regional party organisations awakened a deep response in the heart of every Muscovite, every soldier and the entire Soviet people. The working people of Moscow vowed to fight to the last with the soldiers rather than let the enemy through to the capital, and they kept that vow with honour. During October and November, the working people of Moscow provided five divisions of volunteers to the front. Their total contribution from the start of the war had been 17 divisions. In addition to these divisions of the people's militia, Muscovites formed and armed hundreds of fighting teams and tank destroyer detachments. On October 13th, the party activists in the capital decided to form workers' battalions in every city borough. Within a few days, Moscow mustered 25 companies and battalions with a total of 12,000 men, most of them members of the party or the Young Communist League. 
An additional 100,000 workers underwent military training in their spare time and then joined military units. About 17,000 women and girls were trained as nurses and medical assistants. Members of peacetime occupations, ordinary workers, engineers, technicians, scholars and artists had few military skills. Military service was new for them and they had a lot to learn, even as they were engaged in battle. But all of them were distinguished by common traits, high patriotism, unshakable determination and confidence in ultimate victory. It was no accident that these voluntary units became outstanding fighting forces after they had gained some military experience. Muscovites were the core of many special reconnaissance and ski units and fought in the guerrillas. We can never forget the contribution of residents of the capital who, with their bare hands, constructed fortified lines for its defence. More than half a million people of the city of Moscow and the oblast, most of them women, built fortifications on the distant and immediate approaches to the city. Since the war, much has been said about the frequent references of Hitler's generals and bourgeois historians to Russian mud, cold and impassable roads. These stories have been debunked, but I want to refer the reader once more to what Kurt Tippelskirch has said in his History of the Second World War. It became impossible to move along the roads, with mud sticking to the boots, the hooves of animals, and the wheels of carts and motor vehicles, the offensive ground to a halt. Does this mean that the Nazi generals really expected to roll to Moscow and beyond on smooth, well-graded roads? In that case, too bad for them and for the German forces, who, according to Tippelskirch, were halted on the approaches of Moscow by mud. In those days I saw thousands of Moscow women, unaccustomed to heavy labour and lightly clad in their city apartments, working on those impassable roads, in that mud, digging anti-tank ditches and trenches, setting up anti-tank obstacles and barricades, and hauling sandbags. Mud stuck to their boots too, and to the wheelbarrows they used to haul earth, adding an incredible load to shovels that were unfamiliar in women's hands. I don't think there's any point in pursuing this comparison. I might merely add, for the benefit of those who look to mud to camouflage the real causes of their defeat at Moscow, that the roads were impassable for a relatively brief period in October of 1941. Early in November, cold weather set in, snow began to fall, and both the terrain and the roads became passable. In the November days of the German general offensive, the temperature ranged from 14 to 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and we know there is no mud under such conditions. Even in this cold, Muscovites continued to work selflessly on fortifications. The construction of the outer ring of the Moscow defence zone was completed on November 25th. More than 100,000 Muscovites, mainly women, had worked on it, building 1,428 artillery emplacements, 100 miles of anti-tank ditches, 75 miles of barbed wire entanglements three rows deep, and a large number of other obstacles. However, their contribution to our common victory over the enemy did not end there. The self-sacrifice of the working people in defence of their capital had a tremendous moral effect on the fighting spirit of the troops, augmenting their strength and their will to fight. Each day we received reports about the Muscovites, who laboured at almost all the factories of the capital and on the grounds of evacuated plants to produce arms and munitions for the front. Defence production and civilian efforts during the battle for Moscow. Defence production was underway not only in large plants, but also in workshops of local craft industries and producer cooperatives. We must also not forget that thousands of air raid wardens were on duty day and night on the roofs of the capital. Hundreds of women and girls worked as hospital volunteers, surrounding wounded soldiers with love and care, restoring them to health. Additionally, there was the morale boost provided at the front by letters, telegrams and packages sent by Muscovites and the people of the whole nation. During the entire period of the battle for Moscow, the troops received 450,000 packages and 700,000 pieces of clothing, some of which came from as far away as the Fraternal Mongolian People's Republic, which sent a delegation headed by Marshal Choi Balsan to our front. Through the efforts of the Communist Party, the front and rear were welded into a single, unbreakable unit, 
and that was a key factor in our victory at Moscow. Many difficult tests lay ahead of us. Although the enemy's October offensive had failed, the situation at the front remained extremely serious. However, the fighting spirit of the Soviet troops and their confidence that the enemy would be beaten and thrown back from Moscow remained unshaken. General Artemyev, the commander of the Moscow Reserve Front, was made Zhukov's deputy. Major General Ella Govorov, the deputy commander of the Moscow Reserve Front, was appointed chief of artillery for the Western Front. A few days later, he was ordered to take over command of the 5th Army from General Lelyushenko, who had been wounded. Major General I.P. Kamara became the new artillery commander. On October 17th, the Soviet General Staff and Supreme Headquarters were divided into two, with reserve headquarters set up in the east to function in case Moscow fell. There were rumours that Stalin briefly left Moscow, but if he did, he was back by October 19th, when the state of siege was proclaimed. The November Threat On November 1st, I was summoned to Supreme Headquarters, where Stalin asked, We want to hold the military parade as well as the ceremonial meeting marking the October Revolution, November 7th. What do you think? Will the situation at the front allow us to hold these festivities in Moscow? I reported that the enemy was not in a position to launch a major offensive in the next few days as they had suffered heavy losses in October and were busy reinforcing and regrouping their forces. However, their air force would likely remain active during this period. A decision was made to strengthen the air defences of the capital by shifting additional fighter squadrons from nearby fronts. The traditional Red Square parade took place without incident. After the march past the Lenin mausoleum, the military units proceeded directly to the front. The November parade was of tremendous political importance, both internally and abroad. In anticipation of a renewed enemy drive against Moscow, the Soviet Supreme Command took all possible measures to break up the offensive once and for all. Troop Movements and Reinforcements During the first half of November, troops of the Western Front continued to regroup and fortify their lines. As of 6pm on November 10th, the 50th Army and the entire defence of Tula were transferred by Supreme Headquarters to the Western Front, and the Bryansk Front was disbanded. Its 3rd and 13th Armies were transferred to the Southwest Front. This transfer meant a considerable lengthening of our defence line, and the transferred army was in a weakened condition. However, we continued to receive reinforcements from the Supreme Headquarters Reserve, as well as tanks, arms, ammunition, signal equipment and supplies. Our quartermasters received large numbers of winter clothing, including fur coats, felt boots, warm underwear, padded vests and fur caps. By mid-November, our soldiers were much better prepared for the harsh winter conditions than the enemy, who were seen wearing bulky straw galoshes that greatly impaired their movement. Despite these improvements, reports indicated that the enemy was completing the regrouping of their forces, and a continuation of their offensive could be expected soon. The new infantry and tank units from the Supreme Headquarters Reserve were concentrated in the most vulnerable sectors, especially around Volokolamsk, Klin and Istra, where we expected the main armoured attack, the counter-attack plan. On November 13th, a directive from the Supreme Commander introduced significant changes to our plans. Stalin called me on the phone. What's the enemy up to? he asked. I replied, He's completing preparations in his shock groups and will probably start an offensive soon. Where do you expect the main blow? Stalin asked. Volokolamsk and Novopetrovskoye, toward Klin and Istra. Guderian's army may attempt to bypass Tula toward Venev and Kashira, I answered. Stalin continued. Shaposhnikov and I feel that we must break up the enemy's offensive with a preventive counterattack. One counterattack should bypass Volokolamsk on the north, and the other should be launched from Serpukov against the flank of the Germans' 4th Army. These seem to be the areas where large forces are being massed for the drive against Moscow. Where are we supposed to get the forces for these counterattacks? I asked. The front has nothing available. We have just enough to hold our present positions, I replied. Stalin suggested, you could use the right flank units of Rokossovsky's army, 
the 58th Tank Division, a couple of cavalry divisions, and Devata's Cavalry Corps for the Volokolamsk counterattack. At Serpukov, use Belov's Cavalry Corps, Getman's Tank Division, and parts of the 41st Army. I objected. We can't afford to commit our last reserves to counterattacks. We won't have any reinforcements when the enemy launches its offensive. You've got six armies. Don't tell me that's too little, Stalin countered. I reiterated the problem, noting that our front was overextended and reserves were scarce, especially in the centre. Stalin insisted, Consider the question of counterattacks decided, and let me have your plan by tomorrow evening. I was left feeling depressed, not because Stalin dismissed my concerns, but because Moscow, which our soldiers had sworn to defend to the last drop of blood, was in mortal danger. We were now being ordered to throw our last reserves into counterattacks that seemed highly dubious. Execution of the counterattacks. Fifteen minutes later, Bulganin entered my office, saying, I just had a dressing down, too. He continued, Stalin said, You and Zhukov seem to be getting quite a high opinion of yourselves, but we'll find a way of dealing with you, too. He ordered us to get to work immediately on the counterattacks. Two hours later, front headquarters issued orders for the counterattacks to be launched. These counterattacks, mainly carried out by cavalry, had little impact on the enemy, as they were too weak to affect the enemy's shock forces. The counterattacking forces suffered losses and were not in the right place at the critical moment. Having repelled our counterattacks, the enemy launched their own offensive two days later, on November 15th striking at the junction between the Kalinin and Western Fronts. German Forces and the Second Stage of the Offensive The German command had brought up new forces for the second phase of the offensive against Moscow. By November 15th, they faced the Western Front with 51 divisions, including 31 infantry, 13 tank and 7 motorised divisions, all fully equipped. In the Volokolamsk Klin and Istra sectors, the Germans concentrated the 3rd and 4th tank groups, consisting of seven tank divisions, three motorised divisions and three infantry divisions, supported by 1,940 guns and a powerful air group. In the Tula Kashira sector, their shock forces included the 2nd Tank Army, four tank divisions, three motorised divisions, five infantry divisions, an infantry brigade, and the Greater Germany Motorised SS Regiment, also supported by a powerful air group. The Germans' 4th Field Army, consisting of 18 infantry divisions, two tank divisions, a motorised division and a security division, faced the sectors of Zvenigorod, Kubinka, Narofominsk, Podolsk and Serpukov. Their orders were to hold down the Soviet forces, weaken them, and then launch an attack against the centre of the front toward Moscow. The second stage of the German offensive, codenamed Typhoon, began on November 15th with an attack against the right flank of the 30th Army of the Kalinin Front. At the same time, the enemy attacked Soviet troops of the Western Front in the sector south of the Shosha River, on the right flank of the 16th Army. An auxiliary attack was also launched against the 16th Army near Teryaeva Sloboda. The enemy threw more than 400 medium tanks against our 150 light tanks during their drive toward Istra. On November 17th at 11pm, the Supreme Command ordered the transfer of the 30th Army from the Kalinin Front to the Western Front. This extension of the defence line to the Moscow Sea meant that the Western Front's defensive perimeter had been stretched even further. In addition, Major General V. A. Komenko was relieved of his command of the 30th Army, and replaced by General Lelyushenko. The fighting from November 16th to 18 was a difficult experience for us. The enemy pressed forward relentlessly, regardless of losses, in an attempt to break through toward Moscow with their armoured wedges. However, our defence in depth, with prepared artillery and anti-tank positions and well-coordinated operations, frustrated the enemy's plans. Thousands of enemy bodies littered the battlefield, but at no point did they manage to break through. The 16th Army slowly and methodically pulled back to previously prepared artillery positions, where they renewed their defence, repelling fierce attacks and inflicting mounting losses on the enemy. 
Meanwhile, the State Defence Committee, along with parts of the party's Central Committee and the Council of People's Commissars, the government, continued functioning in Moscow. The workers of the capital worked 12 to 18 hours a day, supplying the front with arms, equipment, ammunition and performing essential repairs. Soon after the Germans had effected their tactical breakthrough on the 30th Army sector of the Kalinin front and on the right flank of Rokossovsky's 16th Army, I don't remember the exact date, but I think it was November 19th, Stalin called me. He asked, Are you sure we can hold Moscow? I ask this with an aching heart. Tell me honestly as a party member. There is no question that we will hold Moscow, but we will need at least two more armies and 200 tanks, I replied. I'm glad to hear you're so sure, Stalin said. Call Shaposhnikov and tell him where you want the two reserve armies concentrated. They'll be ready by the end of November, but we have no tanks for now. Within half an hour, I arranged with Shaposhnikov to station the newly forming 1st Shock Army in the area of Yakroma and the 10th Army around Ryazan. Meanwhile, the enemy had launched an offensive on November 18th in the Moscow-Tula direction. Their 3rd, 4th and 17th tank divisions advanced in the Venev sector, where the 413th and 299th rifle divisions of the 50th Army were dug in. After breaking through the advanced defences, the enemy tank group seized Bolokovo and Dedilovo. To stem the enemy's advance, we quickly moved the 239th Rifle Division and the 41st Cavalry Division into the area of Uzlovaya. Fierce fighting, marked by the mass heroism of our troops, continued day and night. Units of the 413th Infantry Division particularly distinguished themselves. On November 21st, Guderian's main tank force succeeded in occupying Uzlovaya and Stalinogorsk. The enemy's 47th Motorized Corps advanced toward Mikhailov, and the situation around Tula became critical. At this point, the Military Council of the Western Front decided to reinforce the Kashira sector with the 112th Tank Division under Colonel A. L. Getman. The Ryazan sector was reinforced with a tank brigade and other units, while the Tsarisk sector received the 9th Tank Brigade and the 35th and 127th Independent Tank Battalions. The Laptevo sector was reinforced by the 510th Rifle Regiment and a tank company. On November 23rd, heavy fighting developed around Venev. Two days later, the Germans' 17th Tank Division, having bypassed Venev, approached the town of Kashira where General Belov's reinforced 1st Guards Cavalry Corps was stationed after having been shifted from the Serpukov area. On November 26, the enemy's 3rd Tank Division cut the Tula-Moscow Railroad and Highway north of Tula. On the same day, the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, the 112th Tank Division and other units concentrated in the Kashira area repulsed the enemy's attacks, pushing them back southward toward Mordves. To further reinforce the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, the Military Council decided to move the 173rd Rifle Division and the 15th Guards Mortar Regiment into the Kashira sector. On November 27, the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, together with the 112th Tank Division, the 9th Tank Brigade, the 173rd Rifle Division and other units, launched a powerful counter-attack against the enemy's 17th Tank Division driving it back six to ten miles southward. Heavy fighting continued in the Kashira Mordves sector until November 30th, as the enemy suffered heavy losses but was unable to achieve success. Realising that further advances were impossible, Guderian, the commander of the German 2nd Tank Army, ordered his forces to take up defensive positions. Thus, Soviet troops in the Tula area repulsed all attacks inflicting heavy losses on the enemy and preventing any further advance toward the capital. The situation, however, was far worse on the right flank of our front around Istra, Klin and Solneknogorsk. On November 23rd, enemy tanks broke into Klin. To prevent the encirclement of units of the 16th Army, they were pulled back to the next defence line during the following night, and Klin was abandoned on November 24th after heavy fighting. The loss of Klin created a gap between the 16th and 30th Armies, which was covered by a weak, improvised group of units. On November 25th, 
the 16th Army was forced to pull back from Solnechnogorsk, creating a serious situation. The Front's military council moved up all available units, including soldiers with anti-tank guns, isolated groups of tanks, artillery batteries and anti-aircraft divisions to support Rokossovsky's 16th Army. The enemy had to be contained until reinforcements, including the 7th Rifle Division from Serpukov and two tank brigades and two anti-tank artillery regiments from the Supreme Headquarters Reserve, could be moved into the Solnechnogorsk area. Our defence line began to bend inward in an arc, with some sectors greatly weakened, and it seemed as though the situation might be beyond repair. But the soldiers remained steadfast. As soon as reinforcements arrived, the enemy once again faced an insurmountable defence line. On the evening of November 29th, an enemy unit took advantage of the weak defence of a bridge across the Moscow-Volga Canal near Yakroma, seized the bridge and crossed to the east bank. However, they were stopped by advance units of the newly formed 1st Shock Army under Lieutenant General 6th Kuznetsov and driven back across the canal after fierce fighting. On December 1st, the Nazis launched a surprise attack at the centre of our front between the 5th and 33rd Armies, advancing along the Minsk-Moscow Highway toward Kubinka. They were halted at the village of Akulovo by the 32nd Rifle Division, which destroyed several enemy tanks with artillery fire. Many enemy tanks were also blown up in minefields. The enemy then turned toward Golitsino, where they were stopped by the front's reserve and units of the 5th and 33rd Armies. By December 4th, this breakthrough had been liquidated. The enemy left over 10,000 dead, 50 destroyed tanks, and a large amount of equipment on the battlefield. This marked the last attempt by German forces to break through to Moscow. The sequence of events was equally tense in other sectors under attack from the enemy's principal shock forces. The divisions on the right flank of the enemy's Volokolamsk grouping reached a point five miles northeast of Zvenigorod on December 2nd, but were unable to advance further on the following day. To support their other attacking forces, the enemy opened an offensive on the quiet Naro-Fominsk sector on December 1st. They succeeded in breaking through the front of the 33rd Army and advanced to Aprilevka. However, parts of the 5th, 33rd and 43rd Armies counter-attacked on December 3rd and 4, forcing the enemy back to the west bank of the Nara River. By the beginning of December, it was evident from the nature of the military operations and the strength of the enemy's attacks that their offensive was grinding to a standstill. The Germans had neither the manpower nor the resources to continue their drive. From the interrogation of prisoners, we established that the enemy had suffered heavy losses. Some companies were reduced to just 20 or 30 men, their morale had deteriorated, and they no longer believed in the possibility of capturing Moscow. Our troops, despite suffering great losses and exhaustion, never allowed a major breakthrough. Reinforced by reserves and motivated by party appeals, they fought with renewed determination. Over the course of the second phase of the German offensive, the Nazis lost 155,000 dead and wounded, 800 tanks, at least 300 guns, and 1,500 planes. These heavy losses, the collapse of their blitzkrieg plans, and their failure to capture Moscow caused significant demoralisation within the German forces. Their leadership lost its reputation for invincibility, and doubts about the outcome of the war began to emerge. Some German generals and field marshals later tried to blame Hitler for the failure to take Moscow, suggesting that if the drive toward Moscow had been maintained in August, it might have succeeded. However, in my view, this argument ignores key strategic realities. The Germans' failure was not due to the Russian winter or weather conditions, as some have claimed, but because their forces were exhausted, overstretched and outclassed by the resilient Soviet defence. Hitler, angered by the failure of his planned blitzkrieg, dismissed several high-ranking officers, including Field Marshal Walter von Brauchitsch and General Guderian, blaming them for the defeat. He took over command of the German ground forces, believing that his direct involvement would inspire his troops to fight harder. However, this did little to reverse the fortunes of his army. In hindsight, the Soviet defence of Moscow was not just a victory of military strategy, 
but of resolve, discipline and an unyielding will to defend the homeland. The crucial factors in halting the German advance were not only the strength of our troops, but also our leadership, our organisational adaptability and the unity of the people behind the defence of the capital. We were able to improve the control of forces at all command and staff levels, especially in the heat of battle, thus ensuring the precise fulfilment of orders. A major contribution to the organisation of our defences was made by the operational administration of the General Staff and personally by Lieutenant General A. M. Vasilevsky, the Deputy Chief of the General Staff. His assessment of the situation on the Western approaches during the period of October 2nd 9 and his recommendations furnished the basis for the steps taken by Supreme Headquarters. The untiring officers of the General Staff followed every step of the enemy forces day and night, making constructive suggestions during dangerous moments. General Belov gives a sharply differing account of this episode. He says that Zhukov summoned him to his headquarters on November 9th, the day Belov's cavalry unit was incorporated into the Western Front, and advised him that a counter-attack was being mounted in the region of Serpukov, in which the Belov group was to act in collaboration with the 49th Army. Belov was ordered to draft his plans immediately, without even inspecting the lay of the land. A day later, Zhukov approved his plan and took him to Moscow on November 11th to meet Stalin. Belov had not seen Stalin since 1933. He thought he had aged twenty years in nine, his eyes were shifty, and his voice seemed to lack confidence. Zhukov addressed Stalin sharply in a superior tone of voice, and Belov had the impression that Zhukov, not Stalin, was in charge. Stalin seemed to take all this as though it were appropriate, and occasionally a look of something like bewilderment appeared on his face. Zhukov submitted the plans for the counter-offensive, and Stalin approved them with only one change, a day's delay in their start. P. A. Belov, Tsar Nami Moskva, Moscow, 1963, PP 4043. General Lelyushenko blamed L. Z. Meklis, a police general and crony of Stalin's, for the removal and the arrest of Komenko. Meklis was responsible for many such incidents. D. D. Lelyushenko, Zarya Pobody, Moscow, 1966, P. 88. Actually, the pullback of the 16th Army and the subsequent German breakthrough touched off a fearsome row. Rokossovsky was concerned about the length of his lines, the exhaustion of his troops and the increasing German pressure. He wanted to pull back to the Istra Reservoir and the Istra River to create a shorter, more easily defended line. He proposed the withdrawal, but Zhukov refused to permit it. Rokossovsky appealed over Zhukov's head to the Chief of Staff, Marshal Shaposhnikov, a most unusual action. Shaposhnikov telephoned his approval of the withdrawal a couple of hours later, making clear that Stalin had approved the move. Rokossovsky's troops were preparing to pull out when he received a telegram. I am the commander of troops on this front. I revoke the order for the withdrawal of troops to the Istra Reservoir and order you to defend the existing line and not retreat one step farther. General of the Army Zhukov. K. K. Rokossovsky, Voyeno Istorycheski Journal, December 1966, p. 53. Guderian gave this order on December 5th 6. He noted in his journal, The offensive on Moscow has ended. All the sacrifices and efforts of our brilliant troops have failed. We have suffered a serious defeat. Heinz Guderian, Vospominania Soldata, A Soldier's Memoirs, Moscow, 1954, P. 239. The enemy had been unable to break through our defence lines. He could not surround a single division nor fire a single artillery salvo at Moscow. By the beginning of December he was exhausted and out of reserves, while our Western Front was reinforced with two newly formed armies, the 1st Shock Army and the 10th Army, and a number of other units that had been combined into a third army, the 20th. These reinforcements enabled the Soviet command to organise a counter-offensive. The counter-offensive was being prepared while the defensive operations around Moscow were still ongoing, and the final plans took shape when the German forces, having suffered tremendous losses, became too exhausted to withstand our attacks. 
The Moscow counter-offensive was thus a continuation and logical culmination of the successful counter-attacks begun by our troops on the flanks of our front in the last days of November. To take advantage of the favourable conditions around Moscow, Supreme Headquarters ordered the troops of the Kalinin Front, Konev, and the right flank of the southwest front, Timoshenko, to begin a counter-offensive alongside the Western Front. At the end of November and the beginning of December, the Supreme Command, by agreement with the Military Council of the Western Front, had concentrated the first shock army northwest of Moscow and east of the Moscow-Volga Canal. Simultaneously, the Tenth Army had massed its forces around Ryazan. The Soviet people and its armed forces were going through a difficult period. Soviet troops had broken up the German plan to capture Leningrad and form a junction between German and Finnish forces. At Tikvin, the Red Army went over to the counter-offensive, defeated the enemy and recaptured the town. In the south, forces of the Southern Front had also gone over to the counter-offensive and freed Rostov-on-Don. On November 29th, I telephoned the Supreme Commander-in-Chief, reported on the situation and asked that the 1st Shock Army and the 10th Army be placed under my jurisdiction so that I could strike stronger blows against the enemy and push him farther from Moscow. Stalin listened attentively to what I had to say and then asked, Are you sure that the enemy has reached a state of crisis and is incapable of introducing new groups into his forces? The enemy is exhausted, I said, but without the help of the 1st Shock Army and the 10th Army, the troops of my front will be unable to eliminate any dangerous salients. If we don't eliminate these salients now, the enemy may be able to reinforce his groups in the Moscow area by bringing up large reserves from the north and south later. Then our situation would be much more serious. As Stalin said he would discuss the matter with the general staff. I did not want to telephone the general staff, so I asked my chief of staff, General Sokolovsky, who agreed that the time had come to move the 1st Shock Army and the 10th Army into battle, to call the general staff and persuade them to deploy the two reserve armies immediately. Late in the evening of November 29th, we were informed that Supreme Headquarters had decided to transfer the 1st Shock Army and the 10th Army to the Western Front. At the same time, Supreme Headquarters, Stalin, asked to see our plan for the use of these armies. This plan, which I submitted the following day, outlined the following key elements. The first shock army, after eliminating the German bridgehead on the east bank of the Moscow-Volga Canal, was to concentrate its forces in the dimitrov yakroma sector and, in conjunction with the 30th and 20th armies, strike toward Klin and beyond in the general direction of Teryayeva Sloboda. The 30th Army was tasked with defeating the enemy around Rogachevo and Borshchevo, and, together with the 1st Shock Army, seizing Reshetnikovo and Klin, continuing the advance toward Kostlyakovo and Lotoshino. The 20th Army, in collaboration with the 1st Shock and 16th Armies, was instructed to strike from the areas of Krasnaya Polyana and Beli Rast toward Solnechnogorsk, seizing it from the south and advancing toward Volokolamsk. The right wing of the 16th Army was to strike against Kryukovo and Istra. The 50th Army at Tula would strike toward Bolokovo and Shekino. Belov's operational group at Mordves was to advance toward Venev, Stalinogorsk and Dedilovo, in conjunction with the right wing of the 10th Army. The 10th Army, to be deployed between Serebrianye Prudi and Mikhailov, would strike toward Uzlovaya and Bogoroditsk and beyond, south of the Upa River. The immediate aim of the counter-offensive was to eliminate the two wedges on the northern and southern flanks of our front. Subsequent operations would be determined based on the evolving situation, with the overarching goal of inflicting maximum losses on the enemy and pushing him farther from Moscow, thereby eliminating the immediate threat to the Soviet capital. Despite the addition of the three reserve armies, the front still lacked numerical superiority over the enemy, except in the air and the enemy remained superior in tanks and artillery. Therefore, the forces in the centre of the Western Front were tasked with tying down enemy forces through active operations in preparation for a subsequent offensive. I must say here that the experience of war revealed to me the absolute necessity of a front commander working with his military units 
up until the very beginning of an operation or battle. This is essential in order to help the troops understand the situation and to organise their actions. Once an operation begins, and during its course, commanders should remain with their staffs or at command points from which they can direct the troops. In directing the troops during the Battle of Moscow, I was guided by these principles. During the defensive phase, the great length of the front, more than 375 miles, and the complex, crucial situation did not permit the front commander to be separated from his staff. All information about the actions of the enemy, our own troops and the neighbouring fronts rapidly accumulated at the command post, and we were in constant communication with Supreme Headquarters and the General Staff. However, on one occasion during the defensive operations, I was compelled to leave my staff and visit one of the divisions of the 16th Army. Here is how it happened. Somehow, Stalin had received word that our troops had abandoned the city of Dodovsk, northwest of Nakabino. This was very close to Moscow, within ten miles, and he was naturally disturbed by such unexpected intelligence. This was especially troubling since, on November 28th and 29, the 9th Guards Rifle Division, commanded by Major General A.P. Beloborodov, had successfully held off repeated attacks by the enemy in the nearby region of Istra. Yet here, 24 hours later, it seemed that Dodovsk had fallen to the Germans. Stalin called me on the telephone. Do you know that they've occupied Dodovsk? No, comrade Stalin, I didn't know that. The chief didn't wait to find out why I was uninformed. He snapped angrily. A commander should know what's going on at the front. He ordered me to proceed immediately to the spot and personally organise a counter-attack to retake Dodovsk. I argued that it was not wise to leave front headquarters at such a tense moment. Never mind, Stalin said. We'll get along somehow. Leave Sokolovsky, the chief of staff, in charge. Hanging up the phone, I quickly got hold of General Konstantin K. Rokossovsky of the 16th Army and asked why headquarters knew nothing about the loss of Dodovsk. He explained that the Germans didn't have Dodovsk and that the place in question must be the village of Dedovo. He said that the 9th Guards Rifle Division was engaged in heavy battles in the region of Kovanskoye, Dedovo and Snigiri, attempting to prevent a German breakthrough along the Volokolamsk Highway toward Dedovsk and Nakabino. It was clear that the report Stalin had received was a mistake. I decided to call headquarters and explain the misunderstanding but it was like trying to drive a nail into a stone. Stalin was in a towering rage and demanded that I go immediately to Rokossovsky and do everything necessary to ensure that this village was recovered from the enemy. Moreover, he insisted that I take along the 5th Army commander, General Leonid A. Govorov, because he is an artilleryman and can help Rokossovsky organise artillery fire. There was no sense in arguing. When I called General Govorov, he protested vigorously that there was no point in such a trip. The 16th Army had its own chief of artillery, Major General 6th Kazakov, and Rokossovsky himself knew what to do. Why, he asked, should he leave his army at such a critical time? To end the debate, I told Govorov that it was an order from Stalin. We went to see General Rokossovsky and then to Beloborodov's division. Beloborodov was not exactly happy to see us. He was already overwhelmed with problems and now was being asked to explain why the Germans had occupied a few houses in the village of Dodovo, which was located across a deep gully. He outlined the situation and made it clear that there was no tactical reason to recapture these houses, as they were on the far side of a ravine. Unfortunately, I couldn't tell him that tactical principles had nothing to do with our presence there. So I ordered Beloborodov to send a rifle company and two tanks to drive the Germans out of the houses. It was done at dawn on December 1st. Meanwhile, it turned out that I was wanted on the telephone. The line to 16th Army headquarters had been cut, but a communications officer arrived at Beloborodov's division with a message for me to call my command post. When I managed to get through to my chief of staff, Sokolovsky reported that Stalin had called three times asking, where is Zhukov? Why has he gone away? It appeared that on the morning of December 1st, the enemy had launched an attack on the 33rd Army at a point that had been relatively quiet. 
Sokolovsky and I agreed on steps to deal with this new threat, and I then got through to headquarters. Vasilevsky gave me Stalin's orders. Return immediately to front headquarters. In the meantime, Supreme Command would decide how to provide additional reserves to counter the German breakthrough toward Aprilevka. Returning to my GHQ, I telephoned Moscow and spoke with Stalin. I reported that I was aware of the situation and advised him of the measures I was taking to deal with the German breakthrough in the centre of the front. Stalin mentioned neither my trip to the 16th Army with Govorov nor the reasons I had been ordered there. But at the very end of our conversation he asked, Well, and what about Dodovsk? I replied that I had sent a rifle company, supported by two tanks, to oust the Germans from the village of Dodovo. So ended one of my absences from front headquarters during the defensive Battle of Moscow. Then, during the course of the Moscow counter-offensive, I found a trip to the troops essential. I visited the 16th Army of Rokossovsky, the 5th Army of Govorov, the 43rd Army of Golubev, and the 49th Army of Zakarkin. This was necessary principally to assist the commanders in better coordinating their actions with those of neighbouring units, to warn them against frontal attacks, and to persuade their troops to bypass strong points of the enemy and pursue him relentlessly. A week after the counter-offensive began, I issued a directive cautioning against head-on assaults. This was based on the experience of the first days of the offensive. In a number of instances, especially created shock groups, had been drawn into heavy and bloody frontal attacks. For example, in the region of Klin, the advance of the 30th and 1st shock armies had been stalled by such tactics. On December 19th, during an attack on the village of Palashkino, 14 miles northwest of Rusa, Major General L. M. Dovato, commander of the 2nd Guards Cavalry Corps, lost his life. His body was sent to Moscow for burial. Upon my request, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR posthumously awarded him the title of Hero of the Soviet Union on December 21st. Dovato was succeeded by Major General I. A. Pliev, who had commanded the 3rd Guards Cavalry Division. On the left wing of the Western Front, Units of the 50th Army and General Belov's Cavalry Corps had launched their offensive on December 3rd in an effort to defeat Guderian's tank army around Tula. The Germans' 3rd and 17th Tank Divisions and the 29th Motorized Division pulled back from Venev, leaving 70 tanks on the battlefield. Guderian's 2nd Tank Army had greatly overextended itself in its attempt to bypass Tula and had no reserves left. On December 6th, our new 10th Army joined the battle at Mikhailov, where the enemy put up a stubborn defence to cover the flank of the retreating 2nd Tank Army. On December 8th, the 50th Army launched an attack from Tula and threatened to cut off the enemy forces retreating from Venev and Mikhailov. Both the Western Front Command and Supreme Headquarters provided constant air support for the advance of Belov's Cavalry Corps and the 50th and 10th Armies. Threatened by deep inroads on its flanks and lacking the forces to parry the attacks of the Western Front and the operational group provided by the Southwest Front, Guderian's army began to pull back rapidly through Uzlovaya and Bogoroditsk towards Sukhinichi, leaving behind heavy weapons, trucks, tractors and even tanks. In the course of ten days, troops on the left wing of the Western Front inflicted a serious defeat on Guderian's second tank army, advancing 85 miles. To the left of the Western Front, troops of the Bryansk Front, reconstituted on December 18th, also pursued their advance. The first phase of our counter-offensive ended with Soviet forces holding a line running through Oreshki, Staritsa, the Lama and Ruza rivers, Maloyaroslavets, Tikhonova Pustin, Kaluga, Mosalsk, Sukhinichi, Belev, Metsensk and Novosil. The German armies, weakened and worn down by fighting, suffered heavy losses and retreated westward under the pressure of our forces. The 33rd Army received orders to expand the salient it had driven in the direction of Vyazma, and, with Belov's 1st Cavalry Corps, airborne units, guerrillas, and the 11th Cavalry Corps of the Kalinin Front to secure Vyazma. On January 27th, Belov's Corps crossed the Warsaw Highway, 20 miles southwest of Yuknov, 
and three days later joined up with the airborne units and guerrillas south of Vyazma. On February 1st, they were also joined by three rifle divisions of the 33rd Army, the 113th, 338th and 160th, under the personal command of Lieutenant General M.G. Yefremov, and began the battle for Vyazma. To reinforce Belov's 1st Cavalry Corps and coordinate operations with the 11th Cavalry Corps of the Kalinin Front, Supreme Headquarters ordered the 4th Airborne Corps to be dropped in the area of Ozereknia, west of Vyazma. However, due to a lack of transport planes, only the 8th Airborne Brigade, 2,000 men, could be delivered to the target area. At this point, I would like to go into greater detail concerning the operations of Belov's Cavalry Corps, the two reinforced divisions of the 33rd Army, and the units of the 4th Airborne Corps behind enemy lines. In its drive from Narofominsk toward Vyazma, the 33rd Army advanced rapidly by January 31st to the area of Shansky Zavod and Domanovo, where it encountered a broad gap in the enemy defences. The absence of a continuous front line suggested that the Germans did not have enough forces to strongly defend Vyazma. We decided, therefore, to press on toward Vyazma before the enemy had time to move up reserves and, by capturing the town, to place the entire Vyazma grouping in a very precarious position. General Yefremov decided to lead the strike group of his army himself. When General Yefremov's group reached the outskirts of Vyazma, the enemy pinched off the base of the gap, cutting off Yefremov's group and restoring the front line along the Ugra River. The right flank of the 33rd Army was at Shansky Zavod, while its neighbour to the left, the 43rd Army, was held up at Medin, preventing it from coming to the aid of Yefremov's group as ordered. When Belov's cavalry corps reached the Vyazma area and joined Yefremov, it too found itself cut off. By the time the 8th Airborne Brigade was dropped to reinforce our troops around Vyazma, the Germans had been able to bring in large reserves from France and other areas greatly strengthening their defences. We were forced to abandon the entire group in a forested area southwest of Vyazma, where several guerrilla units were based. For the next two months, Belov's corps, Yefremov's group, the airborne units and the guerrillas operated behind enemy lines, inflicting serious blows on enemy manpower and equipment. For instance, on February 10th, the 8th Airborne Brigade and guerrillas occupied the area of Moshanovo and Diaglevo, destroying the headquarters of the 5th German Tank Division and seizing many trophies. After establishing radio contact with Belov and Yefremov, Front Command did everything possible to supply their forces by air with munitions, medicine and food, while evacuating a large number of wounded. Major General V. S. Golushkovich, the operations chief at Front Headquarters, and several signal officers visited the isolated group repeatedly. However, by early April, the group's position had deteriorated significantly. The enemy massed large forces to eliminate this thorn in their side before spring. A thaw at the end of April hindered the group's manoeuvrability and its links with the guerrillas, who had been supplying food and fodder. On request from Generals Belov and Yefremov, the front command approved a plan for the isolated troops to rejoin the main forces. They were to move through guerrilla territory toward Kirov, where the 10th Army was planning to break through the enemy's defences to meet them. Belov's Cavalry Corps and the airborne units executed these orders precisely. After a long, horseshoe-shaped course, they rejoined the 10th Army sector in late May or early June. However, General Yefremov considered the route too long for his exhausted troops and appealed directly to Supreme Headquarters for a direct breakout across the Ugra River. Stalin called me to ask if I agreed. I replied with a categorical no, but the chief insisted that Yefremov was an experienced commander and should have his way. Stalin ordered an attack in the direction of the proposed breakout. The attack was prepared by the 43rd Army and carried out, I believe, on May 17th or 18. However, there was no movement from the other side. We later learned that the Germans had detected Yefremov's movement toward the Ugra River and intercepted the breakout attempt. Yefremov, who fought heroically, was killed in the ensuing battle, along with many of the brave soldiers in his detachment. General Yefremov had taken command of the 33rd Army on October 25th, 
when the Germans were advancing on Moscow. His forces fought courageously, preventing the enemy from breaking through their lines. Yefremov was awarded the Order of the Red Banner for his valour during the Battle of Moscow. Among those who died with him was his artillery chief, Major General Pian Ofrosimov, who was a classmate of mine at the Red Army courses for higher commanders in 1929-30. General Ofrosimov was a fine, capable artillery officer and a man with a deep soul. Belov's group travelled a long and difficult road, skillfully avoiding large enemy forces and destroying smaller ones along the way. It eventually rejoined the main Soviet forces through the gap created by the 10th Army. The group lost much of its heavy weapons and equipment during its operations behind enemy lines and in the breakout, but most of the men made it back to the main front. When they finally linked up with the main forces, the meeting was filled with joy. Soldiers and commanders shed tears, tears of happiness and fraternal friendship. In retrospect, we recognise that we made a mistake in our assessment of the situation around Vyazma. We overestimated the capabilities of our forces and underestimated the enemies, and the situation proved to be much tougher than we had expected. In February and March, Supreme Headquarters demanded that we intensify our offensive operations, but the manpower and equipment available were exhausted, and we were especially short on ammunition. For example, the planned deliveries of ammunition in early January were not fulfilled. 82 mm mortar shells, 1%. Artillery shells, 20 to 30 percent. 50 mm mortar shells, 2.7 per cent. 120 mm mortar shells, 36 per cent. 82 mm mortar shells, total for January, 55 per cent. Artillery shells, total for January, 44 per cent. The planned deliveries for February were also not met. Of the 316 carloads of munitions planned for the first 10 days of February, not a single one arrived. Ammunition for rocket artillery was exhausted, forcing us to send these units to the rear. We had to ration shell expenditure to just one or two per gun per day, during an offensive. A report I sent to Stalin on February 14, 1942, stated, Experience has shown that a shortage of shells makes it impossible for us to carry out artillery barrages. The enemy's firing system remains unharmed, and our forces, attacking without artillery support, suffer heavy losses and do not achieve the expected progress. Supreme Headquarters decided to reinforce the sectors of the Western Front, but it was too late. The enemy had strengthened its Vyazma grouping and resumed its attacks on the Western and Kalinin fronts. Our overstrained and weakened troops found it increasingly difficult to overcome the enemy's resistance. Repeated reports and recommendations from the commander and the military council, urging the need to halt and fortify our lines, were rejected. Stalin demanded that we continue attacking. If you don't achieve results today, you will tomorrow. If you attack, you may at least tie down the enemy, and the results will be felt on other parts of the front. In a directive dated March 20th, Stalin again demanded a more energetic pursuit of our objectives. In late March and early April, the Western Fronts attempted to implement this directive and defeat the enemy's Rzhev Vyazma grouping, but our efforts failed. Supreme Headquarters was ultimately forced to accept our recommendation to take up defensive positions, along a line running through Velikie Luki, Velij, Demidov, Beli, Dukovshchina, Nelidovo, Rzhev, Pogoreloye Gorodishche, Gzatsk, Ugra River, Spastemensk, Kirov, Lyudinovo, Kolmishchi, and the Oka River. This put the Russians completely off balance. The Germans struck hard across southern Russia and soon had the Red Army reeling. The Nazis liquidated the Soviet bridgehead at Kerch, smashed the Soviet siege lines and captured the naval base of Sevastopol at the tip of Crimea. This completed their conquest of the peninsula and freed up a whole army for use elsewhere. They launched a major offensive in the Kursk-Voronezh sector, south of Moscow, and almost broke through once again to the near approaches of the Soviet capital. Most importantly, they began to drive with rapidly increasing momentum towards the Don River Bend and Stalingrad. The unfolding summer warfare was taking a far more dangerous shape than Stalin had envisaged. 
He had expected fresh attacks by almost all his front commanders to push the Germans back toward their homeland. Instead, there was every sign that a new and critical battle would be fought, one in which the stakes were no less than the cutting of Russia in two. The severing of north-south communications, especially along the Volga, the pinching off of the Caucasus and the Maikop and Baku oil fields, and the breach of the new Anglo-American supply line across Iran, which was just beginning to deliver materials in quantity. There was even the direct possibility that the Germans might break through the Near East Land Bridge and threaten India. During the early stages of the Stalingrad crisis, Zhukov remained commander of the Western Front, where little was happening. However, as his account makes clear, he was often at Supreme Headquarters in Moscow, advising Stalin or arguing with him about the major decisions of the war. As tension rose over the South and Stalingrad, Stalin began to reorganise his forces. He created new commands at the front and sent his most battle-tested commanders. First, General Vasilevsky was dispatched to the scene, followed by major political associates, Georgi M. Malenkov, Nikita S. Khrushchev and Vyacheslav Malyshev, the commissar of the armament industry. But none of these moves halted the Nazis in their pell-mell rush for the Volga and Stalin's namesake city. Finally, on August 27, 1942, Zhukov was summoned from the Western Front and named Deputy Supreme Commander-in-Chief. Stalin was Supreme Commander-in-Chief, and this was the first time a Deputy Supreme Commander had ever been appointed. After Zhukov, there would never be another. In an hour of deadly danger, Stalin turned once again to Zhukov. Stalingrad hung in the balance. Its fate, and quite possibly the fate of Russia, was placed in Zhukov's hands. The Battle of Moscow had made Zhukov a national hero. Stalingrad demonstrated his towering command over the Soviet military apparatus. Every Russian commander of consequence participated in some way in the Stalingrad fighting. Men like General Chuikov made their reputations in the titanic struggle that raged in the ruins of the Stalingrad tractor factory and the building-by-building, room-by-room defence of the city on the Volga. But it was Zhukov who bore responsibility for all the armies, all the generals, for the defence of the city, and, most importantly, for the concept, organisation and execution of the grandiose counter-offensive that shattered the myth of Nazi military invincibility beyond repair. Many men naturally worked together in this endeavour, but Zhukov's closest and most important collaborator was his brilliant general staff colleague, General Vasilevsky. After Stalingrad, no one really challenged Zhukov's primacy. His fellow marshals still competed with him for top honours, but he was number one. And after Stalingrad, no one doubted that Russia, with Zhukov at the head of her armies, would finally defeat Germany. The international and domestic situation of the Soviet Union improved somewhat toward the end of the spring of 1942. The anti-fascist front continued to expand and strengthen. In January, 26 nations signed a declaration agreeing to use all available means in the fight against the aggressors and to avoid a separate ceasefire or peace. The Soviet Union reached complete agreement with the United States and Britain that a second front would be opened in Europe in 1942. These and other factors, especially the defeat of German forces before Moscow and the disruption of German plans for a blitzkrieg, greatly invigorated anti-fascist forces in all countries. A quiet period had set in on the Soviet-German front. Both sides had taken up defensive positions, Troops dug trenches, built dugouts, mined the approaches to forward positions, placed barbed wire entanglements, and carried out other defensive chores. Commanders and headquarters staffs worked out firing systems, coordination between services, and other issues. Both Supreme Headquarters and individual military units reviewed the first phase of the war, analysing both successful and unsuccessful operations, and devoted more time to studying tactics and the operational and strategic strengths and weaknesses of the enemy. The Soviet people, inspired by the Red Army's great victory around Moscow, laying the basis for a fundamental turning point in the war, completed the wartime reorientation of the Soviet economy. Increasing numbers of new tanks, planes, artillery pieces, rockets and munitions began to reach the armed forces, 
New strategic reserves were being formed in the country's interior. The increasing production capacity of Soviet tank and artillery industries allowed Supreme Command to begin forming separate tank corps and armies, supplied with the most modern equipment available. The armed services also began receiving modernised 45mm anti-tank guns and new 76mm guns. New anti-tank brigades and divisions, intended for combat against large enemy tank units, were formed, and steps were taken to improve air defences for both the armed services and the country as a whole. The Soviet armed forces began to form separate air armies. By June, the country had eight such armies. The long-range bomber force and air reserves of Supreme Command also received reinforcements. By June 1942, the total strength of Soviet forces had risen to 5,534,500 men, 4,959 tanks, 40,798 guns and mortars, and 2,480 planes. The armed services expanded military training and mastered both the latest combat experience and new weapons. The party's Central Committee, after reviewing political work in the armed forces, took steps to improve the party apparatus and propaganda. L.Z. Meklis was replaced by A.S. Sherbakov as the head of the main political administration of the armed services and the Central Committee tasked the military councils of individual fronts and armies with improving political work to tighten discipline and strengthen the troops' fighting capacity. The German command was also preparing for the summer campaign, still viewing the Soviet front as its main theatre of operations. The Nazi leadership continued to send satellite forces to the Eastern Front. By May 1942, Germany had deployed 217 divisions and 20 brigades along the Soviet front, with 178 divisions, 8 brigades and 4 air fleets being German. Because of the absence of a second front, Germany was able to keep as little as 20% of its forces engaged elsewhere. In general, Hitler's political and military strategy for 1942 called for the defeat of Soviet forces in the south, the conquest of the Caucasus, an advance to the Volga River, and the seizure of Stalingrad and Astrakhan. This would set the stage for the eventual destruction of the Soviet Union. Although the German command retained superiority in manpower and materiel, its plans for the 1942 offensive had to account for the fact that it was no longer capable of launching simultaneous offensives on all strategic fronts, as it had done in 1941 with Operation Barbarossa. The spread of German forces from the Barents Sea to the Black Sea had led to a corresponding decline in operational density along the front. In response, the German command reconstituted Army Group South, concentrating forces in the southwest sector, which Hitler's Directive No. 41, dated April 5, 1942, outlined as the area of primary focus. The Germans sought to gain control of the Soviet Union's industrial and agricultural regions, particularly the oil-rich Caucasus, thereby gaining a dominant strategic position and additional resources to fuel their war effort. Stalin, on the other hand, had little faith in the assurances from Churchill and Roosevelt about a second front in Europe, but still hoped they would open one elsewhere. He believed the Germans would launch offensives in two strategic sectors during the summer of 1942, most likely in the Moscow sector and in the south. Stalin expected minimal German activity in the north and northwest, assuming the enemy would focus on straightening the front and improving force disposition. On July 4th, after a nine-month siege and fierce fighting in which Soviet sailors and soldiers gained immortal glory, Sevastopol was abandoned by our forces. This meant the complete loss of the Crimea, greatly complicating the overall situation and naturally improving the position of the enemy, who now had an additional army available for reinforcement. On May 3rd, the Northwest Front began an offensive against the 16th German Army at Demyansk, the battle, which lasted an entire month, did not bring success, even though heavy losses were inflicted on the enemy. Around that time, I spoke to Stalin by telephone about the Crimean Front and the situation in the Southwestern Command. He said, Now you see where defence is getting us. He added, We should severely punish Kozlov, Meklis and Kulik for their carelessness, so that others will stop dilly-dallying. 
Timoshenko will start his offensive soon. What about you? You still haven't changed your mind about our tactics in the South. I said, No, I still feel that we should harass the enemy in the South with airstrikes and artillery fire, wear him down with defensive actions, and only then go over to the offensive. However, troops of the Southwest Command began an offensive on May 12th in the direction of Kharkov by making two thrusts, one out of the Volchansk area and the other from the Barvenkovo salient. The Southern Front was charged with the operation in the Barvenkovo salient. However, the Southwestern Command had neglected to consider the threat posed by a large concentration of German forces in the area of Kramatorsk at the base of the salient. After launching their offensive from the Barvenkovo salient, troops of the Southwest Command broke through enemy defences and advanced 15 to 30 miles in three days, but that was as far as the operation got. On the morning of May 17th, 11 divisions of German Army Group Kleist went on the offensive in the slavyansk kramatorsk sector at the base of the Barvenkovo salient against the 9th and 57th armies of our southern front. The enemy broke through the Soviet defences, advanced 30 miles in two days, and drove a wedge into the flank of the left wing of the southwest front at Petrovskoye. I was present during a conversation between Stalin and Timoshenko in mid-May, and clearly remember that Stalin expressed serious concern about the threat posed by the enemy's Kramatorsk grouping. Timoshenko reported that his military council felt the threat had been exaggerated, and that it was not sufficient ground for halting the Kharkov operation. That same evening, Stalin discussed the matter with N.S. Khrushchev, a member of the military council of the Southwestern Command, who expressed the same views as Timoshenko. The Southwestern Command maintained these views until May 18th. On the evening of May 18th, the deteriorating situation began to give serious concern to General Vasilevsky, the acting chief of general staff, who urged Stalin to halt the Kharkov operation and to use our forces in the Bavenkovo salient to parry the attack by the enemy's Kramatorsk grouping. But Stalin rebuffed Vasilevsky by citing the recommendations of the Southwestern Command. The existing version, Khrushchev's, that the military council of the Southwestern Command warned Stalin against continuing the Kharkov operation does not correspond to the facts. I can make this statement because I was present during Stalin's conversations. On May 19th, the Military Council of the Southwestern Command finally understood the situation and began to take steps to rebuff the German attack, but it was too late. By May 22nd, the 6th and 57th Armies, parts of the 9th Army and General L. V. Bobkin's Operations Group were completely encircled. Many units succeeded in breaking out, but others could not and fought until the end rather than surrender. Among those who lost their lives in this battle were General F. Y. Kostenko, Deputy Commander of the Southwest Front, General K. P. Podlas, 57th Army Commander, General A. M. Gorodniansky, 6th Army Commander, and General Bobkin. The latter had been a classmate of mine in refresher courses for senior commanders. All of them were remarkable men, excellent commanders, and loyal sons of our party and our country. When we analyse the failure of the Kharkov operation, it is easy to see that the basic reason for it was an underestimation of the serious threat posed to the Southwest Command and our failure to position Supreme Headquarters reserves in the area. If several reserve armies had been available in the rear of the front, we could have avoided the catastrophe of the Kharkov operation in the summer of 1942. Heavy fighting continued in June along the entire southwestern sector. Under heavy enemy pressure, our forces pulled back with great losses to the Oskol River, where they attempted to set up defence lines. On June 28, the enemy opened a broader offensive, striking out of the Kursk area in the direction of Voronezh against the 13th and 40th armies of the Bryansk Front. On June 30th, the German 6th Army in the Volchansk sector went on the offensive in the direction of Ostrogozhsk, breaking through the defences of the 21st and 28th Armies. The situation of our forces in the Voronezh area steadily deteriorated, with some of them caught in a trap. Here is how Marshal Vasilevsky assessed the situation in his memoirs. 
The situation in the Voronezh area greatly deteriorated by the end of July 2nd. The enemy had broken through our defences at the junction of the Bryansk and southwest fronts to a depth of 50 miles. The front reserves available in this sector were thrown into battle. There was evident danger that the enemy's strike forces would break through to the Don River and seize Voronezh. To prevent the enemy from forcing the Don River and to stem his advance, Supreme Headquarters assigned two of its reserve field armies, the 6th and the 60th, G. Zizh, to the Bryansk Front Command, and ordered them stationed along the right bank of the Don River between Zadonsk and Pavlovsk. At the same time, the 5th Tank Army was transferred to the Bryansk Front, with the objective of joining the Front's own tank units in counterattacks against the flank and the rear of the German forces driving toward Voronezh. Prompt decisive action by the 5th Tank Army could have changed the situation in our favour. However, the Tank Army received no instructions from the Front Command on July 3rd. Having first instructed the commanders of the army and of the Bryansk Front to prepare promptly for a counter-attack, I myself went to Yelets on orders from Supreme Headquarters to speed the movement of the 5th Tank Army. Despite the assistance provided by Supreme Headquarters and the General Staff, the situation on the Bryansk Front continued to deteriorate, largely because of command failures at the front and army levels. Supreme Headquarters therefore ordered the Bryansk Front to be broken up into two fronts, with a new Voronezh Front under N.F. Vatutin, and K.K. Rokossovsky replacing F.I. Golikov in command of the Bryansk Front. The participation of the 6th and 60th Field Armies and the 5th Tank Army somewhat strengthened our defences in the Voronezh area, but did not entirely eliminate the danger of an enemy breakthrough across the Don and a thrust along the Don towards Stalingrad. As a result of our loss of the Crimea and the defeat of Soviet forces in the Barvankovo salient, the Donetsk Basin and near Voronezh, the enemy had once again seized the strategic initiative and, with the help of fresh reserves, began his rapid advance toward the Volga River and into the Caucasus. By the middle of July, the Germans had thrown our troops back to the Don River from Voronezh to Kletskaya and from Surovikino to Rostov, and had launched a battle in the bend of the Don River in an effort to break through to Stalingrad. Due to our forced retreat, the enemy gained control of the rich regions of the Don and the Donets Basin. We were faced with the direct threat of an enemy breakthrough to the Volga and into the northern Caucasus, and the loss of the Kuban Plain and all communications with the Caucasus, a key economic region supplying oil to both the army and industry. At that point, the Supreme Commander-in-Chief issued his Order No. 227, which set in motion severe measures to combat panic-mongers and violators of discipline and condemned defeatist tendencies. Order No. 227 was backed up by intensive political agitation and other measures on the part of the party's Central Committee. Troops of the Southwest Front suffered heavy losses in their retreat from the Kharkov area and were unable to halt the enemy's advance. The Southern Front, also suffering substantial losses, was unable to stem the Germans' advance into the Caucasus. In an effort to prevent the Germans from reaching the Volga River, Supreme Headquarters set up a new Stalingrad front on July 12th, including the 62nd Army under Major General V. Yakolpachi, the 63rd Army of Lieutenant General VI Kuznetsov, the 64th Army, and the 21st Army of the abolished Southwest Front. The overall Southwestern Command, which had lost its purpose, was liquidated on June 23rd. The entire military council of the former Southwest Front joined the new Stalingrad Front, which was further reinforced with the 1st and 4th Tank. Armies, still in the process of formation, and remaining elements of the 28th, 38th and 57th Armies. The Volga Flotilla was also placed under the Front Command. The construction of defence lines and fortifications began on the approaches to Stalingrad. As in the defence of Moscow, thousands of citizens participated and selflessly prepared the city for defence. Both the regional and city party committees of Stalingrad organised the formation and training of people's militia and worker defence detachments, reorganised production for the needs of the front, and evacuated children, the elderly, and valuables from the city. On July 17th, 
the Stalingrad front held a defence line running from Pavlovsk along the left bank of the Don River to Serafimovich and Kletskaya, then south to Surovikino and Verkne Kurmoyarskaya. Meanwhile, the southern front had suffered irreplaceable losses in its retreat. Its four armies numbered little more than 100,000 men. In an effort to strengthen the command of forces in the northern Caucasus, Supreme Headquarters abolished the southern front and transferred all its remaining troops to the North Caucasus front under Marshal S. M. Budeni. The 37th and 12th armies of the North Caucasus front were tasked with covering the Stavropol sector and the 18th, 56th and 47th armies covered the Krasnodar sector. By the end of July, the Stalingrad front was made up of 38 divisions, half of which had 6,000 to 8,000 men, and the others had from 1,000 to 3,000 men. This amounted to 16 divisions of normal strength. These small forces had to cover a front 330 miles in length. The total strength of the front during that period included 187,000 men, 360 tanks, 337 planes, and 7,900 guns and mortars. Against this front, the enemy had massed 250,000 men, 740 tanks, 1,200 planes, and 7,500 guns and mortars, resulting in a ratio of 1.3, one in manpower, one, one in guns and mortars, two, one in tanks, and 3.6, one in planes. Because of Soviet resistance on the approaches to Stalingrad, the enemy later shifted the 4th Tank Army from the Caucasus for a thrust from Kotelnikovo and threw additional satellite troops into the battle. Directive No. 45 of the German High Command, dated July 23rd, ordered Army Group B to cover its northern flank along the middle course of the Don River, where Hungarian, Italian and Romanian forces took up positions, to seize Stalingrad and Astrakhan and gain a stronghold on the Volga River, thus cutting off the Caucasus from the rest of the Soviet Union. To achieve this objective, the Army Group had the support of the 4th Air Fleet, with 1,200 planes. On July 26th, German armoured and mechanised forces broke through the defences of the 62nd Army in the Don River Bend and reached the Don in the area of Kamensky, north of Kalach. Supreme Headquarters ordered the front to be reinforced with the 1st and 4th Tank Armies, which were still in the process of formation, and had a total of only 240 tanks, as well as with two rifle divisions. These additional forces were unable to stop the enemy's advance, but helped to slow it down.